I moved to Champaign-Urbana because of the music scene. This is Champagne is also a band podcast. One songwriter, one song. I'm Sven, your host for a journey into the music of Champaign-Urbana. Recorded in the Blue Box studio with a songwriter from the Champaign-Urbana music scene, past or present. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to be a part of the Champagne Showers podcast network. Welcome to Champagne is also a band podcast. Today, I have Larry Gates, and you may know Larry from such bands as Worm, later changed to Starlight and Yuck, The Goody Patch, Sativa, Lorenzo Getz, The Jezebelli, Curb Service, and DJ Leg 2. So, Larry, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So today we're going to be listening to your song, Take It From Me, which was released as a single. So without further ado, let's listen to the song. Welcome back. So, Larry, you may or may not know, but my first and favorite question to always ask is, what came first? Was it the music or was it the lyrics? Definitely the music in this case. This song is unique in a number of ways. If anybody has been a fan or even casually listened to Curb Service, they were probably a little surprised at the flavors I was throwing out there. And this was a song, I love it when this happens, but sometimes as a songwriter... 
you start out on one path and the song itself will tell you, nah, we're going over here. And you can fight it and try to stay true to what you originally set out to do, or you can follow that instinct and follow that song. And that's what happened with this one, for sure. With that in mind, was it that bass and guitar riff was the beginning part with, or was it like the beat or, yeah. or what was, what was happening there? Well, here's the story. This song took about two and a half months to write. And sometimes I can write a song. I wrote, I wrote three and a half songs this week. I've only written two songs this whole year, but I did a, a writing exercise this week where I went out of town and got a, a camper on a lake and no movies, no television, just food and music and what comes out of that. So I got three and a half songs out of it in, in four days, which is pretty good output for me. So this song, we got to go back to Thanksgiving weekend last year. I was watching that Beatles documentary on Disney that Peter Jackson edited. I may or may not have had about 30 milligrams worth of edible in me at the time. And some of the band trauma and drama that was happening on screen was very triggering for me. I'm not an anxious person, but so I attribute this to the the uh, THC is that I, I got a little panicky because if you've seen that documentary, it's such a special thing that you're a fly on the wall watching one of the most historical bands make one of the most historical albums. And they've been sitting on this footage for 50 plus years. And here we are watching it. And I got real anxious about the tension in that band because I've experienced band tension being a musician for a long time. So I had to take a break from watching it. And I went up in my guest room and I, I grabbed the guitar and that riff just, I mean, within 10 minutes, the song was structured. I had it immediately. It poured out of me. And so what I do these days, so my studio is separate from my house. So rather than go out and boot up the studio, I just grab my phone, hit voice memo and got the riff down. Okay. So it's safekeeping. I've become smart about that because there are so many riffs I've lost, you know, to the ether if I don't document it. So I put down the structure and then a few weeks later, I made a proper instrumental demo and sent it to Anthony Gravino and Ian Shepard, who play with me in, in Curb Service when we're a, a live band configuration. Probably mid-December, about two or three weeks later, we went into Anthony's studio, a High Cross Sound in unincorporated North Urbana, Illinois, and we just tracked the instrumental. And in my head, as I'm putting this tune together... I wanted it to sound like, you know, um, Scott Pilgrim versus the world, the yeah. graphic novel and um, flawless movie. You know, he's in a band called Sex bob which uh -huh. is kind of like an amped up beauty shop is what they sounded like, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's sort of this anti-folk punky thing. That's what was in my head when I was writing the song. And so I, when I tracked it, I was on acoustic. I was in the control room on acoustic. Anthony was on bass. Ian's in the live room on drums. And my note for Ian, Ian is such a precision player and, and has such good feel, but I wanted him a little off the leash. I was like, play a little more like Dave Grohl would. Play a little more dangerously. Do some stuff you wouldn't normally do. And really pushed him to go out of bounds with it. And But it was still this acoustic bass thing, because I'm still thinking the whole time, sex ba -bomb. And so we tracked the instrumental. I took it with me. I traveled over the holidays, and I took it with me and, and was trying to write to it and trying to write to it. But what happened was I went back to my studio, and I started to hear this like fuzzy T-Rex 70s guitar. But when I started to track that, it was a much bigger guitar sound. So what I'm doing there is I've got a, a Supra amp and then I'm running out into a pig nose and those are mic'd separately. So it's the same guitar performance through two different amps and pan. That's why it so, sounds, that's how I got the big sound. But once I added that, I went, oh shit, it's a Nirvana song. It's not a Sex bob -omb song. Right. It sounds like, and so follow that and support that. Do what you can, don't fight against it. Do what you can to support that flavor. And so the acoustic guitar went away and all I needed was that sloppy Cavalier solo that's in there. Just like, rah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. just don't give a shit about it. Just play. Just just wag on some notes right there. And then when I sat down to write it lyrically, I mean, that happened within an hour and I tracked the vocals right away. And huh. So I tracked the vocals and guitar at my place and then took it back to Anthony's to mix on his incredible gear. I mean, he has a great API board and lots of outboard gear. And so we mixed and mastered it over there. And I, sonically, I'd never been more proud of a song. And that was kind of the goal with this one was like, how good can we get this to sound more so than any other song? I mean, it was just an instrumental 
I thought it was going to be one thing. It turned out to be another, and we completely chased it down that rabbit hole. I've gotten a lot of great feedback on the song. A lot of people yeah. gravitated towards it. So as left field as it is, I've kind of embraced that. I was telling a friend yesterday that like Beastie Boys are my idols for a number of reasons, but the main reason is they didn't adhere to any rules right? There's hip hop and there's punk and there's a country song and there's weird instrumental jammy stuff. And it was just all output. We're just right. creating, right? And they were always just the coolest to do it. I've taken off the shackles of genres and expectations and go, whatever song I feel like writing that day is is my prerogative. You know, there are no rules in art. Just make something. Let's talk about that timeline. So it was Thanksgiving mm-hmm. 2021. Yeah. And then how long was it before you added the lyrics? It was probably early January. Yeah. So okay. it, was, it was nearly, yeah, just shy of two months in. Okay. And I, I was just beating around that instrumental. And it, when I write a song, at least, you just kind of hum. It was also rewarding to watch in, in the Beatles doc, watching them work on songs and, and seeing them do the same damn thing that I do, which is mm. you just kind of hum until a phrase or a sil- a, something syllabically clicks, you know, or a word that becomes a stake in the ground. And now we circle that stake and now that becomes this thing, you know, just kind of fumble through it. You know, once that started, I mean, like it happened within a few hours, uh, lyrically, it just came out. You're searching for the syllabic or or a phrase that kicks in there what was that syllabic phrase that kicked in it wasn't the phrase in this particular instance two things how those verses are structured to repeat the last line after each line the take it from me was probably the thing that came first and the double meaning there which is Mm. take my advice no take it from me i know what i'm doing right or physically taking something robbing me of Hmm. something right and sometimes i use them back to back in a line you know take it from me you won't take it from me you know that was probably the stake in the ground i did not intentionally sit down to write about my relationship split but it's one of those things that if you open yourself up and you're being honest in the moment that that sort of thing is probably going to come out Uh so after the fact i realized oh yeah i just wrote this autobiographically i did not intend to but it, it, it was inevitable That's interesting because I was going to pose a fan theory, so to speak, of what this was, this song was about. I had this weird feeling that, yes, it was about a relationship, but then I also was thinking about how this is about music and a band or or working with another person. And the fact that you said that that came out of watching the Beatles documentary and the conflict or even just the method in which they work on Mm -hmm. things. There's a few things like everybody want to get back line mm-hmm. and i was thinking about like on stage you know the back lined <laughs> in- instruments yeah. so i was like maybe so what that what that line means to me what my intent was is when you're in a somewhat high profile relationship in a small town and then that relationship ends everybody wants to know what happened uh-huh. and everybody wants to know if things are cool or if there's some pettiness and and people are getting back at one another right which uh-huh. was not the case parallel to that the Beatles documentary is called Get Back. And so subconsciously, I think that landed in there, but that was not intentional. But that's what the Get Back line is. She got a one track mind. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking of if you were to record a demo, you would be recording like one track, right? right? It'd be like, like as on your phone. Right. I had this thought of the first double verse Mm -hmm. is a music, but kind of starting up, you know, this idea of I have a passion about music, but I don't know what that's going to entail. That first verse was like, I don't know what this is going to entail. The second verse I was thinking about, you're into the music, Mm -hmm. right? Like you're in it, always like the encore, like being called back because you're quote unquote famous, so to speak. Like that's the idea, like baby say it with me one last time, Um, you know, like everybody's like, oh, play one more, one more song, one last time. I'm just running with this theory. I love your theory. Um, The third verse I think of it is like this future self, like if you're going to be like washed up or like, what do you have to do to get back to it? You know, like someday I'm going to get that shine, like you're going to get that shine back or whatever. Not not to say that it's easy to say like, oh, every song is about a relationship, but it could have been your relationship to music too, right? Yeah. So I yeah. love that you're peeling back the layer there because there probably is some subconscious just seeing the few things that are parallel to the, the Beatles stock or band trauma and all of those things. I'm a little like shocked about that because <laughs> it sounds like it was not in your forebrain. It was maybe floating around the back, but it was born out of that tension yeah. Interesting. So, how did this song uh, start to 
form a an idea where you you knew what that that line was take it from me Mm -hmm. but when did you say this is the theme that i'm going to go with like how did you does did the question make no sense, absolutely but, yeah. when that first line came you know when the the baby says she got a one track mind so that's when it became a relationship song and like i said not even trying to be autobiographical but it happened anyway so then the take it from me comes about you know in that first verse i got a light that's mine you know i have a personality that's not going to be crushed by this incident mm-hmm. right i'm going to shine on right you're not going to take that away from me then i knew it what what it was supposed to be lyrically when did you add the chorus to this the song for the most part is that riff that anchor you mm-hmm. know in, in a way that first chorus explodes like yeah. it just explodes and that's when you're just doing those bar chords like right you know the the good old like heavy right into it how did that come about like that was all just... there from the from the instrumental that that was the oh. chord progression that that I wrote, and we just knew in, in putting it together that I tracked the acoustic, the acoustic goes away, I had the big electric, and then there's a mid-rangey electric, a little more bitey one that comes on, and that's what gives that little lift there. So, yeah, if you listen to those early 90s Alterna songs, which it, it sounds like that's a Butch Vig production trick, is that you just take things up a notch by adding, adding a little more of a, mm. a bitey element in there. But yeah, that was there all along, musically. The drums were played by Ian Shepard. Yes. There is a bass in yeah, there, right? That's doubling Anthony, to, Yeah, Anthony, Anthony Gravino's bass. playing bass, oh, yeah. Okay. And so, he he and I are basically playing the same thing. Just tried to make it tight, you know. It's a little overdriven, too, you know. It's yeah. got some it's got some bite to it as well. I feel like there's this this weird quality about the way that you did this that... And, and not weird, but it's a different quality that you did where you had the whole format out before there were words which maybe in my limited experience as a songwriter i feel like that's almost dangerous or limiting but it it works for you because you know you don't know where the words are going to end up right right. It, it seems that this instrumental highly influenced what you were going to end up putting in and and laying it out definitely based on yeah and the and the band was really curious about that too because we had this bridge part and rocked it out you know they weren't sure what it was going to be and then once the heavier guitars were on there then that's when i was like okay really lean into that nirvana thing here this is a this is the moment to really lean into it the most i I would say i got lucky but like i told you i wrote these songs this week and i did the same thing i would sit until i had riffs and all the changes and movements and i would track that guitar Mm. and then i would listen to that until i had my words down so i i went about everything this week the same way and that's strange because i remember if i go back to lorenzo getz songs to you know 18 years 16 years ago probably chords and lyrics together i would just pound it out until i had the whole thing i don't know what spurred this method that i'm into right now but it's it's uh, getting me there. So, I was thinking, as you're describing that method, that that was how you generally write. But it sounds like you... That's new, yeah. You construct them... Typically, you, you've you constructed them in the past, like, simultaneously rather than whole music and then concept and lyrics right. later. When it's, when it's a guitar-driven song. So, there's oh. another avenue, which is beat-driven songs, you know, a traditional curb service song. I just have dozens and dozens of folders that are beats in progress, right? Some further along than others and some better quality than others. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is about every three months, I just purge. I go in and I open a beat and I've got a choice to make. I can either try to save this beat and make it into something or I can throw it in the garbage and move on. And I I'm not precious about it. Like, I have no problem huh. murdering my darlings, you know. If it's not moving me and I've had this beat for six, eight months mm. and I I have no problem trashing, I'll come up with something better. So, eventually, those beats get structured into something resembling a song. You know, there's an intro and there's a verse. There's 16 bars for a verse and then it has a B section and it might have a breakdown, whatever. I start all of those in propeller head reason. That's my MIDI program of choice. So that's where all the beats, drum machine sample MIDI stuff. And I stem all of that out and put it into pro tools. And that's where I've got hands on. So guitars, live bass percussion. And and if I'm scratching any samples and of course vocals. And so that's a whole other approach to songwriting. Sometimes doesn't even involve a guitar that it's all percussive and beat driven. And then even melodically, I just approach it in a a different way than I am with a, 
with a three chord guitar song. There's kind of three ways that I approach things. The simultaneous or the, this new trend or the beats first. Somehow we all manage to get in the same place in the end, but how we get there right. is so the different. The fellas were so thrilled with what I came up with on the bridge because when we tracked it, they had no idea what that part was going to right. be. And in fact, the first half of it was longer. You know, the the second half is that it does it a little twice and then it does its build. That was twice as long. And so we shortened it and just just made it a little snappier. And, you know, that phrase came to me and, and dealing with the whole thing, whether it's a band or a relationship, you know, you got to hit the bottom before you can come back up, you know. In, in recording the vocals, you know, in your chorus and in your bridge parts, there's layers upon layers of vocals going on there. Are those all you yeah. or how did that come about or, or what, what was the idea or I guess it does mimic some of the 90s oh, yeah. grunge sound. Yeah. I've been double tracking vocals for a long time. The, the same reason that Wayne Coyne from the Flaming Lips and John Lennon is we're all guys who hate our voices if they're naked and exposed. And I've always just loved that effect. I mean, from there were records I listened to as a child that I was so drawn to certain moments and didn't know why. Hmm. You know, the slapback delay on Billy Joel's, what's the matter with the car? You know, the still rock and roll to me. Uh -huh. I just knew I loved, I didn't know what it was or what they were doing. Or John Lennon double tracking or the sound of Brian May's guitar tone and We Will Rock You is like the coolest sounding guitar. So, so I was always drawn to these things and double tracking became one of them. And so I did it some in the Lorenzo Getz days, but I do it constantly in curb service. And it's just, a, even the demos that I, the songs I wrote this week, I double tracked everything just for the demo. <laughs> And the reason I do it for a demo is I don't want to be distracted at how shitty I sang it. And when there's two of me, one covers the other's mistakes a little right. bit. And so I could just focus on the lyrics and the melody and what it really is without getting. So I double track the, the verses, but I think there's three of me, if not four of me, I think there's three of me on the, on the chorus. So mm -hmm. you do the Beyonce thing, which is there's a Larry left and right. And then there's one in the middle and it's just a wall of, of vocals coming at you and just try to make it big. I usually like to mention what my favorite part of the song is, and I love how the song is very singable. Like, you could sing along, like, any person could sing along with this. Right. And it's not not saying, like, that that the vocals are too simple, but I think that they're just very, there's a certain, like, visceral quality to them, like something that it sticks with you and it holds in your head I'm going to have to say that that's probably my favorite part is that it sticks in your mind and I could I could totally see you playing this on stage and having front row singing it back at you while you're singing it. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is. Like it just if I knew what that was, I would totally bottle that because it's there's something about that like if you can do that, you've got something. So I I just well, I, I just thought I'd say that. Yeah. Well, mission accomplished because I I've really been trying to focus on the earworms and try to make a simple song as catchy as possible. I've been playing these acoustic shows where I have a, a silly interactive game with the crowd. It's called Three Song Monty. I let people pick cards and they have categories or artists on them. And when they pick a category or an artist, I will play three songs from that category. So if they pick a oh. card that says Motown, here are three Motown songs. Here are three Prince songs. I'm choosing from hundreds of songs that I've built up over the years, and especially during the pandemic when I was doing live streams, there's two things that all the songs have in common is one, they're all songs I love because I won't play songs that I don't love. The other thing is that they are simple songs. During the pandemic, I was doing a live stream every week and I'm learning nine to 12 songs every week to play for my friends online. They couldn't all be Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, right. they had to be simple songs. And so I've really been trying to boil things down to keep it simple, keep it catchy as you can, but still being honest. And so uh, everything that I've written this year, I think, falls in that category. So, by design, it's an earworm because I want it to be. Sometimes it comes easier than other times. And now I have to ask you, what is your favorite part of the song? I like most of it. I really like that bridge. I really like how that bridge comes off the leash just a little bit. Talk about simple. It's one line repeated and not much else going on. Chord progression, why it's, it's an E to a D, you know, right. and we we build on the... On the B, I think, as we mentioned, we weren't sure what that was going to be, hmm. you know, when when we recorded it instrumentally. And so to find it after the fact um, hmm. was very rewarding. Why was this the song that you chose to talk about today? Because it was so left field, because it was not a traditional curb service song or 
Larry Gates song, if I'm going that far, and how proud we were of it sonically. Even you write songs for so many years and write hundreds of songs and record albums on various budgets over a timeline of varying experience and resources, and then you can come across that oh, we wrote a good song and we played it really well and it sounds great. You know, it's mixed well. Very proud of that one. And then, like I said, it is set off. I wrote that one and I, I, I wrote another song a few months ago and then three this week and, and, and all been focused on, like I said, a simple song, an earworm. And so this is the one that set it off. And it's the one that I don't know that I've gotten better feedback from a song. You know, when we dropped this as a single, a lot of folks reached out. And so I knew it was resonating. I knew I was onto something there. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support Jubilee Cafe. Jubilee Cafe is a free weekly meal program at Community United Church of Christ, 805 South 6th Street in Champaign, Illinois. Jubilee Cafe serves a home-cooked meal from 5 to 6.30 each Monday. Their mission is to feed hungry people by cooking healthy, delicious meals and by serving their guests restaurant-style with servers waiting on tables. Jubilee Cafe is open to anyone who cares to eat with them. Because food insecurity among students is so high, they serve students as well as others in and around the Champaign-Urbana community who struggle with hunger. Meals are free to all and will be served each Monday evening, located in the accessible lower level of the building at 6th and Daniel Streets in Champaign. For more information on the meal or how to volunteer, Go to the Jubilee Cafe CUCC Facebook page or email them at jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. That's jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. Welcome back. So, Larry... What is your favorite Champagne Urbana venue? Good question, and that answer has probably changed over the years. Currently, the Rose Bowl Tavern is the heartbeat of our entire scene. I love the owners there. I love the staff. I love how diverse the calendar is. And they're doing sometimes three and four shows a, a day, every day. God bless them for keeping that pace. It's a great sounding room. They redesigned the, the stage and... My buddy Tim Edwards come in and kind of tuned the room and did that back wall. And they've really invested in their space and they've made it something special. You know, 15 years ago, my answer, I always loved playing the high dive. It was one of the best sounding rooms, best sounding stages to play on. And we had more than a few great nights at the Cowboy Monkey for a little sweatier and more intimate experience. And so we've been blessed to have, you know, stages to play on over the years. But there's the ebbs and flows and the changes, and, uh, and here we are. So, Rose Bowl gets my vote. It's interesting what has come out of the pandemic and those that were willing to, you know, pivot and make choices about how they were going to proceed. The ability for the Rose Bowl to be able to have outdoor shows, to kind of bring it all back. It was one of those things where it had been so long since I'd been at a live show that it was like, oh, please, please let's let's do this let's see it as someone who's been around in the champagne urbana music scene for a while i'm just kind of curious here's my left field here you're gonna follow how has the champagne urbana music scene changed in the time that you've been here god ask me how it has not changed i mean you know so you've been in bands bands don't always unless you're aerosmith or or right. up until recently, the Rolling Stones, you know, bands break up. Somebody or a, a few somebodies has an artistic idea and you get together and you write some songs and you rehearse to varying degrees of perfection and you book a show and you tell your friends and that happens. And so Champagne has the history there. You know, we've been fortunate enough to have these giants to stand on top of o over the years you've got this transient student population that also feeds it you know student bands or people who went to school and stick around i moved to champaign urbana because of the music scene mm -hmm. i would come there and watch bands at that time in the 90s there was a, a great venue on green street called mabel's that was upstairs it became a bro bar called brothers which i don't even think is open anymore but a great second story rock and roll club and god i wanted to play there you know and where the cowboy monkey is now was the original blind pig also a great rock and roll room and so we'd go watch the 
poster children and smoking popes. And I didn't live here. I would drive. I was I could get into bars at 19 over here. So I come over and, you know, show my ID and watch my rock and roll and move to Champaign in 2000. That's where I wanted to be. That's where I was coming for all my culture. So to see bands to go record store digging at Periscope or Record Swap or Record Service, to go thrift store shopping at Dandelion, to go to art house movies at the co-ed and the art theater, to see plays at the Station Theater and at Cranard. All my culture and the good restaurants, it was all in Champagne, so I wanted to be there. So I moved there in 2000 and started a band immediately. It was Lorenzo Getson. Probably by 2003, we had ourselves a little bit of a scene going on again. You know, and these things ebb and flow and you know, a couple people catch fire, a couple bands catch fire, and that was the case for Poster Children and Hum. And you got a couple of bands on major labels and getting some international accolades, and that helps bolster a scene a little bit. But then, you know, things recede. And by 2003, four, and five, you know, we had the Beauty Shop and the and the Living Blue and Headlights, Temple of Lowmen, and you could go out multiple times a week to different venues and see some really good bands as we've established bands break up and things happen and so the face of it changes and a few people continue on you know i like to think of elsinore as one of those bands that came in during that hot time when a lot of the other bands broke up they they were able to continue into the next era of grand grandkids and, and some other bands that were popular along those lines and then, you know, what we've experienced recently is unfortunately the, the champagne venues stop being venues. And so now it's really hard to play outside of summer street fest type things and a few beer gardens. It's really hard to play in downtown Champagne. I think that's unfortunate. I think that when you just have bars and restaurants and not a lot of live music that you're cheating yourself out of the potential culture there. So Urbana is the shining light nola's as a stage inside and and a patio out back rose bowl's killing it there's the sip yard which sometimes has music the imc a little harder to book but still there's a stage available there and so i'm I'm hoping for more growth in urbana doesn't mean there's fewer bands it just means there's more competition to get those stages you know you also have to look at you know there was a time when there were only a handful of visible hip-hop artist in champagne urbana you know and i worked with crooked a lot i don't know if you were hip to him in in the mid-aughts from uganda east africa he was here but now you've got a lot more people making noise on the hip-hop level and the canopy has been very welcoming for those artists as well and, and that front room has served them and so we still have artists we still have some ogs like uh brandon t and i are still out there making music and you have to, we were talking about the Rose Bowl and, and pandemic, you have to adapt. They were smart enough to adapt and go, well, we're going to stream some live music and we're going to have a convenience store. They had a convenience store open. I would ride my scooter down there and buy uh, CBD elixirs that they got from Mars Brewing uh, just as a way to support them. But they were smart enough to adapt and we as artists have to do the same thing. I played at Urbana House Party Friday night. I hadn't done that in years, but there were 30 people in a living room dancing their butts off all night and it was fantastic yeah. you know so you got to think outside of the box sometimes and you got to drive to sedoris and play in, in somebody's yard too and that keeps your scene alive because that keeps your music community intact we could all be so segregated in our little creative spaces but getting us in the same room is helpful and i've always thought that champagne had such a tight-knit community and there wasn't anything more than a little bit of healthy competition like there's nobody's trying to cut anybody down and champagne does a great job of helping each other up to the next level or the next thing and supporting our artists but i would love to see downtown champagne get with the program again and reinvest in their artistic community yeah here's the big question that i've been asking you know since since the pandemic is what do you think makes a good music scene Well, you need folks to show up. One of the things that made that scene work in 2003, 4, 5, and 6 was the bands were supporting each other first and foremost. So if I had the night off, if I wasn't playing or rehearsing or recording, I'd go watch The Living Blue because they're just down the street, you know. And once you get six or eight bands in the room, now we've got a crowd. And then you've got those people who just love music and want to support it. But without a crowd, you're just a, a knucklehead up there making noise, right? That's what I said at the Urbana house party is folks were appreciative of it. And I said, well, you know, thank you for showing up and dancing because otherwise it'd just be weird, you know. Uh, <laughs> so th- that's what it takes is, is supporting it. Go out, show up, show up and listen, man, I don't want to hear about cover charges or donations when you're paying 12 bucks for your coffee or whatever. Like 
come on, nobody in town is asking that much of you, you know, to, to show up and, and hear their art. So we need asses in the seats. This is what we need. To me, that starts with the artist. Go out and support your friends. One of the things that I'd like to see more of, and, and maybe I'll just cut this out, but is I'd love to see more all ages venues mm -hmm. where people can not just know the big name bands that came from here, but more of like the bands that are just starting up or, or that they were just like, hey, I just happened to be over at the IMC and guess what? I saw this new band that I hadn't heard of them, but they were there and it was amazing. And because I feel like we're missing out on this opportunity of being able to inspire one another, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I didn't realize that music could be, you know, like I never thought somebody could articulate music that way. I think we could certainly use more all ages venues or more all ages opportunities. Absolutely. I wish the IMC was, was a little more active. And I don't know what that takes. Maybe that just takes someone to drive that bus and, or maybe they have to make booking there a little easier, but I want to normalize non-traditional venues, whether that's a house party or an independent media center or a backyard or whatever it is. Yeah. Any given night you can go see somebody do their thing. Yeah. It'd be great. I don't see a reason not to. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support Exile on Main Street. Exile on Main Street, located in the old train station building at 100 North Chestnut Street in downtown Champaign, has been helping to build record collections since 2004. Carrying a wide array of new and used LPs, CDs, and video games. Exile on Main Street has something for just about any music enthusiast and old school gaming devotee. Exile also hosts regular free live music shows on its stage, so be sure to check out their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for the up-to-date details on the next upcoming event. Open seven days a week. They can be reached by phone at 217-398-MAIN. That's 217-398-6246. Welcome back. So, Larry, what is your favorite non-musical thing or things? This is a tough question, but I think the answer is college basketball. I'm a big college basketball fan, and more specifically, a big University of Illinois college basketball fan, and have been for years. I played, despite my vertical limitations, I played in, in high school in a year in, in college and coached over the years. And I, I grew up in Indiana, and so... You know, basketball is kind of king in Indiana, and, and we watched Bob Knight coach at Indiana University and Gene Cady coach at Purdue University, and I remember in the late 80s seeing the Flying Illini play, and I would often watch Big Ten games, so I knew all of those schools, but that team was so special and so explosive and dynamic and such great characters on that team, and I've been watching Illinois basketball ever since, and it's just gotten better and better, you know, and move here and be able to go, and now I have season tickets. And the trend that they're on right now in the last four years and, and the, the squad that's coming together this year, holy cow, I'm so excited for it. Mm. March Madness is my absolute favorite time of the year. That's Christmas for me. I will watch way too many basketball games and in a condensed time. I even went to the Big Ten tournament this year and I, I watched 10 games in three days of just <laughs> slumped in my seat watching you know, team after team. Mm. I just love the sport. I love how beautiful it can be when played well at, at a high level. That is by far what gets me through most Midwestern winters is mm. uh, looking forward to a couple of ball games a week. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say it is very fortunate that basketball is a winter sport, like that it, that it happens at that time. Are are you more of a I mean, maybe this is not a great question, but are you you're more of a fan of going to see a live game or watching it at home on on the TV or it doesn't matter? It does not matter. Uh, it's different and sometimes I like the convenience of of being home. But the energy in those places, you know, State Farm Center, when you've got 15,000 people rocking, it gets so loud in there. And, and that can impact a game as a, as a former player and, and coach and spectator. You see the, the momentum shifts over the course of a 40-minute game 
And that crowd has so much to do with that, you know, mm. two or three things go right and, and the opponents have to take a time out because the energy is just, it's all one sided. Huh. And so that's what I do like about the live experience. I'm not a fan of basketball fans. If I can say that, yeah, I don't, that's, that's, that's not basketball specific. That is sports fans. I, I don't, the worst thing about sporting events to me are sports fans. So I'm not the loud, obnoxious person who's yelling at the refs from the cheap seats, even though they can't hear me, but I have to sit next to those assholes, you know, it really, it really breaks my heart that we can't all just have fun. But yeah, you're kind of surrounded by different versions of the same person, especially at the tournament is what I realized is when you're at the big 10 tournament, it's only the most rabid fans from each school are there and they're all the same you right. know they're they're decked out in their gear and they're all obnoxious and entitled and and loud and drunk and you know they're just all the things i don't want to spend my day around easily the worst part that, that that's the trade-off though is the the energy can be incredible you know and you happen to be there for one of these legendary games in a last minute shot or you know when they got the share of the big 10 title and beat iowa this year i mean it was an incredible thing to witness but you know, when March Madness happens, I have no problem being on the couch and watching six games in a row. Right. Well, Larry, thank you for being on the show and telling me all about your song, Take It From Me, talking about the scene a little bit and your favorite non-musical things. So, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm honored to be here and I love what you do. Without folks like you who actually care, the scene's weaker without somebody. So, I, I think I said this earlier before we were recording, but I'm so glad that you have all those anniversaries pop up on your feed so that I can pay attention even more to the local scene. So don't ever discount your place in all of this, that you're an important factor in, in the scene that we do have. And I appreciate it so much. Thanks for listening to Champagne is Also a Band podcast. This is Larry Gates reminding you, great music's out there. Go find it where you live. Champagne is also a band. You almost have an NPR voice. It's so good. Do a studio. South On the inside. And all I needed was that sloppy Cavalier solo that's in there. Just like...